Michael Order from Freiburg. Yeah. yeah. So, we to talk about extensions to you. Ah, about some things that are going on in Freiburg and I want to present. And, uh, yeah, basically, this, this was uh, done by some students of mine, which will appear during the talk. So, um, the outline is this. I want to uh, basically talk about two topics. One is the one effective Pandemal scheme, which uh, the others would like, basically. But uh, we have implemented, and uh, we give some comparison. It's not that bad. And uh, then I will take... <laughs> <laughs> the other way. <laughs> then I will talk a bit about uh, the implementation and the usage of excited state forces that we have in our GPO, and uh, finally, I will present uh, the parasitical uh, continuum model that uh, Alex has implemented in GPO. So, the first thing is uh, from the Waals interactions, which were missing before in usual CFT like LDA or PDE. But, uh, and there are two strategies yesterday we heard about, the strategy of having a non-local kernel to describe the non-local uh, correlation energy, and uh, which gives the VDVDF functional. And uh, an older approach, I would say, I think it's older, uh, which comes basically, uh, the big guy is, uh, here he, had, he made this TFTD approach, which just adds this London term of the dispersion interaction, so it's 1 over R to 6, so R is the distance between the atoms, and then you have such a C6 coefficient here, which gives you the strength of the van der Waals interaction. So this is basically the, the part of, in the in the Lena Jones potential that you have, and uh, this C6 is in the Grimme versions, it's highly parameterized, and uh, but uh, no, that's not work. No, but in uh, Tachenko and Scheffler uh, published 2009 a version where they derived the C6 coefficients by upper initial values which I like a lot, and uh, the only thing what they have to parameterize is basically cutoff function, and this cutoff function you have, have to introduce because uh, 1 over R to 6 explodes if the atoms come too near. So it basically just cuts off this, this contribution here. And uh, what they show is that uh, with some approximations you can uh, get the C6 which uh, for, for heteronuclear uh, pairs you can derive it or de write it down in terms of uh, homonuclear uh, C6 coefficients or C6 coefficients for the same atoms like carbon-carbon and uh, the nice idea what they had is that uh, the effective C6 coefficient depends on the environment of these atoms. So you have some effective polarizable volume here, uh, which uh, you can relate then this effective, this should be AA here, with the effective C6 coefficient to the free atom C6 coefficient, which you can calculate by up initial means. And this effective um, volume that you have is here determined by some Hirschfeld composition, decomposition of the, of the density. So um, it's basically a charge decomposition. It's different than the Bader decomposition that most people use, but, and uh, somehow the Bader doesn't work. I, I tried it out for for, uh, for graphene, but uh, it doesn't work at all. But they have worked uh, works quite good, and uh, so we have implemented this in into the GPO code, and with it we get another 
uh, charge decomposition is the Ashford decomposition by free. No. And uh, this, uh, yeah, I forgot to say, uh, what one, one good thing is, of course, uh, if you have this, this expression here, then the calculation is extremely fast. So the basic, uh, the time consuming thing is to calculate the, the GGA, so the PBE uh, energy, and this is, is just added after this calculation. And uh, it works really good for, for this S26 test set of, uh, of uh, small molecules that uh, interact via Van der Waals uh, forces and uh, one sees it, it nearly outperforms all other approaches, at least for yeah, this. The function is fitted to S22. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the cutoff function is yeah, fitted yeah, to it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's really just one parameter, which, which is not bad, I would say. So, so compared to Kringo or so, where you have hundreds of parameters, it's, it's not bad. But anyway, we applied it to some real problem, or some toy model of the real problem, and this is the uh, interaction <laughs> of polymers with uh, graphene oxide, which is a topic uh, for our experimentalists. So, um, graphene oxides are, are well, one way to, to separate uh, graphene sheets, is, uh, which is more promising than uh, using this scotch tape of kind, is uh, to, to oxidize graphite and then uh, heat it up or, or reduce it chemically and then it explodes basically so, so the, the sheets separate and but then you are left with, with oxidized graphene sheets and we wanted to know what is the influence of these uh, defects that one introduces on the on, for mixing the polymers and the toy model is just to use a benzene molecule and look at the interaction with uh, oxidized or defected graphene and uh, uh, Mohamed uh, made a lot of uh, different defects and studied uh, the interaction, the Van der Waals interaction with, of benzene with, with the defects and uh, compared it to pristine graphene, which is this one here, and these are the, the binding energies and these are the different defects that one has. And here we, we compare uh, the TSO9 results and the VDF results and basically what we learn from this is that uh, the qualitative <coughs> agreement is really good. So, so we can use both for such coarse grained uh, studies here. And so this was uh, from the fundamentals and uh, the next thing what I want to tell is uh, about uh, the excited state forces and our motivation why we want to study this is uh, this that one has in organic uh, solar cells one has here the active layer is a donor acceptor plant usually and uh, no one really knows what happens at this heart of this donor acceptor plant uh, at the charge transfer process so when the charges are separated and our idea is for how to study it is uh, to, to have a single or some more donor and acceptor uh, complex and uh, our collaborators, uh, the experimentalists, they, they want to put this into helium droplets where you can resolve uh, spectra, so these are optical spectra <coughs> at a very high precision, so, so this uh, red, reddish line here is the optical spectrum of a molecule in solution and this, these peaks here are the really vibrationally resolved optical spectra that they can measure in helium droplets and uh, we want to, to know, uh, can we describe this vibrationally resolved uh, spectrum somehow in with our codes and uh, so I asked
ask my students who is to, to work on this and uh, this is the TDDFT spectrum of uh, this, this molecule, PTCDA and uh, just for until maybe uh, I, I look on that if it's converged and if this is converged with the number of holes and uh, holes that I take into account so, so basically Usually it converges for the first excitations, it converges quite good and uh, one can test it quite easily uh, by using the, the casita matrix. But anyway, uh, it's wrong anyway because uh, we have 2.4 electron volts here and uh, so the measured value is 4.6. So, but this, this is TDDFT, the PVE. But what, what is important here for this uh, vibration resolved things is that uh, the nature of the excitation is nicely described. So basically it's a homo to lumo transition. For these small molecules it's mostly quite simple what happens. And uh, what we see here from, from the orbital picture of the homo and lumo is that uh, they have different characters. So, so here for the homo you have a bonding region between this carbon atom and uh, there is another below and antibonding for this bond here. And this changes here in the lumo, so we can expect that uh, the excitation gives some force on the bond or changes the bond type and so gives some force. And uh, I've implemented the excited state forces up to now only numerically. So it's quite costly, but it's uh, parallel, parallelized uh, because it's a nicely parallelized uh, problem. So these are the excited state forces that one gets out, these, these little errors for, the, for these excitations. And um, usually what one does, and what is a good approximation, is that you assume that in the ground state you have the, the same vibrational frequency as in the excited state, but you shift the, the zero point, so to say, in the nuclear coordinate. So you have some, some delta which gives this shift. And from this delta, you get uh, uh, so-called huan ruiz factor, from which you can calculate the frank Compton factors. And uh, we get from these uh, forces, one can by, by using the, the harmonic approximation, one can get back this delta, and from this, the huan ruiz factor, and then from this, the, the frank Compton factors, which are important for this. And all this is now in ASA and uh, in GPO, and this is the comparison to the experiment for this molecule, and it's really amazing, so you have uh, here below at zero, you have the zero zero transition, so without vibrational ex excitations. And these up here, these are the, our calculations. So the red ones are single excitations or single vibrational excitations. Blue ones are multiple, and uh, green ones are uh, combinations of different vibrations. And down here are the experimental ones, so I think the agreement is really good. And finally, the, the last topic is uh, the polarizable continuum that uh, Alex uh, Held is here implementing in the moment. And that the idea behind of this is that uh, if you have a molecule solvated, say, in water, one thing to, to uh, have the effect of the solvation could be, of course, to, to put lots of water around, but this is very expensive, of course, and one wants to go to a description where you have this uh, solute molecule in some kind of continuum of this solvent around, which will <coughs> also have some, some thermodynamic uh, reasoning, of course, because this, this is just a static picture and you would have to average uh, over a lot of uh, different solvent, uh, oh, so, solvent structures around. Yeah. And uh, the, the sol solvation and 
energy change that you have basically is what you have to do is to dissolve a, a solute molecule in uh, you have to create a cavity in the, in the solvent this costs energy or free energy here and then you get through the polarizability of the surrounding you get the electronic term so you change the, the Poisson equation as we will see and then you get also an interaction term because you have the interaction between this solvent molecule and and a uh, solute molecule and the solvent around. And we ignore the other terms which depend on the other uh, thermodynamic terms here for the moment. So the cost of the cavity is basically it's proportional to the surface of the cavity and the, the surface tension which we get from the from, uh, experiment. So this is in and uh, the surface basically we define over the van der Waals radiative uh, of the uh, atoms that are involved, the atoms from the solute molecule. The interaction is basically the most important point uh, term is here the, the Pauli repulsion from the solute molecules to the uh, solvent from the solvent molecule to the solvent molecules and this can be uh, effectively calculated over the spill out electron density that you have and type the spill out into the solvent and this, this is the solvent distribution so basically the conversion <coughs> function for the solvent and uh, the electron term uh, it involves the uh, modified Poisson equation which one can then implement basically numerically as we did it in G4 now. And uh, with this uh, modified Poisson equation or Poisson solver that uh, Alex has implemented, it works quite good. Um, I want to, to, there are many technical things and uh, I don't want to go into, but just one thing <coughs> which I think is nice uh, what he uh, used is uh, the thing for, for charge systems and uh, there the, the problem is already for uh, gas based calculation that uh, the Coulomb field for charged uh, for a charge system is very long range, it goes like one over R. So one wants to get rid of this long range thing because uh, this, uh, uh, you would have to have a very huge uh, unit cell to describe this. So the approach that is in already is uh, if you have to solve the usual Poisson equation for charge, uh, charge density, so you have this Q here, if you integrate over the charge density, then you use the fact that you know the, the solution, the analytic solution for, for Gaussian charge density, and you just subtract the Gaussian with the with weighted by this Q, so in the end you have to solve something for a neutral charge distribution. But now we, we do not know this relation anymore because we have a different uh, Poisson equation. So the nice idea that uh, Alex had was that we, he uses the analytic solution of the Gaussian that we know and just applies the, the numeric uh, modified Poisson equation and gets out a numeric density which corresponds to this analytic solution. And clearly this, the integral is not uh, anymore 1 like before for the Gaussian, but uh, now it's 1 over some alpha. But you, uh, during this integral we know alpha and if we wait then uh, this Gaussian uh, field here by, by this alpha and q, then we get again the equation for a neutral system. So it solved this problem. And uh, here it, 
one has to, to fit some things, to, so, so I will come to this uh, later, to uh, how the cavity looks like and so on. And uh, one, in every implementation of the PC, PCM models, uh, one uses a fit. And uh, here he, is, he shows that uh, the fit using three molecules, which should describe more or less the, the most important uh, um, functional groups that are in these uh, molecules, one gets quite good accuracy, so it's 1.4 kilocalories per mole, which the chemical accuracy is 1 kilocalorie per mole, which is really great. And uh, this works quite good here. And this is then the, the application to, to other systems. So these are charged systems that we have here. And the fitting uh, set was here, basically. This is the experimental uh, solvation energy and against uh, the calculated one. So the fitting set was here, and you can apply it for a much larger range molecules, so this works quite good. And uh, also we have quite accurate forces, so you can uh, do structure relaxation and this was uh, one point in these forces was how to construct the cavity. So basically in the cavity you have the polarizability of water which is 80 in the continuum here and you have to, to exclude it where the molecule sits here, this is for the sodium chloride line. And uh, so it depends how steep you make this, this rise, and this is one of the fitting parameters, and uh, Alex uh, has managed to, here this is the error of the, of the forces relative to, yeah, the, the error of the forces, the blue one, is the, the gas phase calculation, so it's a logarithmic scale, and uh, with a function that uh, Alex uses, <coughs> this yellow thing here, one gets up to the accuracy of a gas phase calculation. And one of the applications, uh, or the first applications, was um, we have uh, one. We have shown in, in some publication that one can explain the uh, strange capacitance dependence of uh, gold clusters in ionic liquids here by, by some restructuring of the ionic liquids, which is not important here. But what is important, uh, but what is important here is that we did these calculations in the gas phase, and we have the same qualitative behavior as here. We have a peak at at the charge zero, but if you look at the scale, this is Zetafarad and this is Atafarad. But this is clear because we are in the gas phase and uh, basically a uh, polarizable medium scales the, the capacitance. And uh, so if we then apply this polarizable medium to the bare gold cluster, so the polarizable medium is then the ionic liquids. Basically, we come to the to the order of magnitude of the experimental capacitance here in this region, where the, this uh, switching of the ionic liquids is not important anymore. So this is other for us here, and we have about this range. So and this was it already. With this, I want to say thank the group in Freiburg and, of course, all the contributors without uh, the other contributors, without uh, them, uh, this work would not have been possible, and the computation resources. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So, it's time for some questions. Uh, well, two comments about polarizing the media. I didn't, it's not that I dislike the Zinku Sheffler method at all. I just comment on some, I have some reservation about all the sales arguments. That's, that's it. Just the one part about the polarizable, polarizable media, because I don't want to end up with having this attack. I think the work you did with polarizable media called water, I mean, real yes. polarizable media, yes. very nice. Yeah. And it's very, very useful, obviously, for, for uh, um, 
for my model. Yes. Uh, and I did notice that you, you were worried about choices, and I assume that that means that you were also thinking about counterlines. Or is that something you can put in there or not put in there? Right now, the, the easiest way for me to put charges on a DNA would be just to add in the full background charges, which is not entirely satisfactory. Okay, yeah. about putting the positive charge with you know, the DNA is sort of a kind of weird or happy. Um, are you able to, with, this, uh, with this, this way of reformulating to actually somehow extract the thermodynamics of those counterarms so that I can get back to just calculating the charge uh, DNA? If I have one of that. Yeah, I should be able. I mean, yes, yeah. which, is, which is a dipole. Yes, but if yeah. you even at the counter arms. Yes, you, you can do basically everything with this PTM model cell. So there is a nice, nice publication uh, where they did it uh, sequentially, so to say. So, so they, they put some biomolecule into water and then they extracted some of the water molecules explicitly and you, you can see it, it just goes straight so, so everything is smooth and you can understand it so then you can also add counter ions of course into water if you want yeah, and the, the, more, the more explicit you need and the more um, influences you have by the explicit uh, position structure of the water around, you can put them in one after the other place. Okay. And it should work. Okay. In your cyclistic calculations with the forces and the vibrational spectra, do you yeah. assume that the oscillator strain is always the same along the reaction coordinate? <coughs> and this is just the same picture basically. Yeah? Yes. Yes. In principle, one could also get those main strengths at each position. Mm -hmm. you, can, you could also follow this path, but we did not even follow the path, basically. What we do is... Uh, okay. Yeah, basically we, we have to set a picture. We are in this structure at zero here. We go straight up, we look on the forces, and then mm -hmm. just from the forces, we determine what is the delta. So it's just very static. And I think for, for uh, if you really, really would like to do a propagation and uh, maybe also uh, hopping between different exciting states, then uh, the numeric is quite bad. So someone should sit down and uh, put it analytically in, but I wanted to have something fast. And, uh, it works. At least it works.